Hey everybody, welcome back to our weekly podcast. You remember me. My name is Patrick Tan, General Counsel for Chain Argos with the blockchain intelligence firm that uncovered the fact that Binance's BUSD was under collateralized by 1.4 billion US dollars. Not just that, I mean a lot of stuff happening with Binance this week. As usual, every week is my CEO partner in crime, Jonathan Reiter. Say hi everybody. We finally got him out of hiding. He's back. I, actually, this looks more like a bunker than, anyway. So he, he, he came back from being on the run last week. If you watched last week's episode, he was on the run. But we managed to finally locate him. We're back in the bunker again where we're safe. We're, right. we're well above ground, it's, it's to be said. We're not actually in a bunker. But. So thanks for tuning in. Um, thanks for all the comments from the last uh, episode. Um, and this week, obviously, we have to talk about Binance because this is a big week, not just for Binance, but it's a big week for the industry. Um, you know, we've had a whole bunch of questions uh, come in. We can't answer all of them just because there's just too many. But... Um, we're going to talk about Binance this week. We'll talk about a whole bunch of blacklisted wallets that we've been um, monitoring, observing. If you've been following us on Twitter or X, it's now known. Um, you know, we've listed a whole bunch of wallets, funds flowing through them. And finally, we talk a little bit about pig butchering. So that's what we're going to talk about this week. Quite a lot of ground to cover, so you can expect that you'll have to wind down the speed of which I speak by at least like 0 0.7, 0 0.8 times. So um, anyway... Let's just talk about Binance. So it's um, this is it, right? I mean, this is like uh, in some ways, some people have said this. This is the end of an era. Um, uh, Four point three billion dollars uh, fine. Uh, of course, if you actually go through the nitty gritty of it, it's not all at once. It's not everything everywhere all at once. It's it's there's like staged payments and stuff like that. Um, and this rolls up a number of other <coughs> yes, historical correct. and yeah. slightly pending settlement payments, which is also standard procedure. Yeah. So you have a bunch of stuff. Um, and then you know, uh, CZ has agreed to some kind of custodial sentence, presumably. I mean, the judge gets to pick the sentence. There's no, yeah, I, I, the there's no specific to agreement on the sentence, sentence. But he gets to build his own prison. Uh, no, my my understanding was that the deal was that he would not appeal as long as, as, long as the, the term was shorter eight, than eighteen months. months. Yeah, yeah. yeah, so the term is longer than eighteen months. He gets to build his own prison in the Catskills. Okay, that. Uh, <laughs> I mean, to be clear, the judge could decide it's a massive number. He could appeal and get rejected, and it's anyway. Right, that, that, that's a feature of the U.S. legal system. That's not a feature of the prosecutor cannot make binding deals on behalf of the judge for U.S. constitutional reasons that are not important for this podcast. Okay. So. Um, we have got that, and he's got a, like a some some have called it a slap on the wrist, um, a fifty million dollar fine. Oh, the personal fine uh, as the opposed personal to the personal fine, business. fifty million. Um, I mean, he owns what <coughs> substantially all the exchange, so there isn't really a difference there. But okay. Yeah. So um, there's that. Uh, well, well, actually, no, no, no. He doesn't really own all of the exchange. That's actually not true. If you go back in time a little bit to the history of Binance. Um, there, there were early investors. I don't he know owns he bought them a all. lot of the he exchange. Owns, yeah, yeah, correct. I mean, that's, it, it, that's this true. is not a situation where he's the CEO of a company that he owns 1% of the... <laughs> correct. So J Jamie Dimon owns some shares in J.P. Morgan. Yes. Right. So in some sense, when he agrees a fine on behalf of J.P. Morgan, he's paying it as the 1% shareholder. The, yeah. If you're the 75% shareholder, there's little difference between your money correct. and the company's money. So yeah. it's, it's not that yeah, kind yeah, of correct. It's not that kind of distinction. So uh, let's talk about Binance. You've, uh, we've gone through the cons consent order. Um, uh, bear in mind, none of this is uh, like it's it's not a formal. I don't even believe one hundred percent of the exhibits have been made public yet. Correct. Most of the stuff, but the final plea agreement hasn't been settled, and the whatever. So there's still, some, still there's still some ways to go. Yeah. Um, but just looking at that consent order, I mean, I have my most immediate concerns about some of these things is um, lookbacks. So the lookbacks basically, you have to go and look back at all of your transactions to see if you've violated anything, you know, you've evaded sanctions and stuff like that. And if you have, then you have to, you know, sort of like resubmit. Um, what's that? A suspicious activity report. Yeah. Um, given what we do know, at least from public documents, court documents, SEC uh, suits against Binance, these were people who didn't really keep a lot of copious records. Um. Well. <coughs> okay. So. I, I'm not sure how I feel about that. Certainly, they weren't filing suspicious activity reports in real time. No, I mean, not. that's the substance of the of the, yeah. the deal. Whatever. But whether or not the database, transaction histories, whatever, contain sufficient information to reconstruct that stuff fairly easily now is possible. possible. I mean, every time I have worked with a trading system within a usually a bank, and then there's a bunch of other systems, the only one where the records are properly reliable is the trading system, right? Nothing else. There's comment fields and yeah, the sales yeah, yeah. credit system. And, and, and. So as long as the trading system has, you know, been around consistently, right, because if you screw up 
the details of the trades, you start having massive P&L problems all over the place and stuff's missing and the computer doesn't work. Um, whereas you can cobble together the accounting reports, you can cobble together various filings. So I suspect that the trade database is okay and they can figure this stuff out historically, right? Whether they kept records of what deposit and withdrawal addresses correspond to what account numbers, almost certainly they do because yeah. again, it would be harder to purge that stuff in a way that didn't break things yeah. than to just keep the table around. I guess we'll find out. Um, I mean, the FBI definitely has computer forensics experts. So if they're like, oh, we lost our database, we need help restoring it. Yeah, uh, <laughs> whatever their cloud services provider based in the Western <coughs> District of Washington, I think we can figure out who that is. Uh, you know, it, it that should all be solvable. Right. In fact, one might wonder if record preservation requests weren't passed to the cloud services provider based in the Western District of Washington quite some time ago, because, of course, stuff like that happens. Um, Amazon says they don't have access to your data, but that doesn't mean that they don't have access to your data in the sense that they can like make sure there's a backup yeah. of your S3 bucket or whatever yeah. it is. I'm pretty sure that's a service that they've had since the beginning because, you know, of course, they have. Anyway. So, oh, oh, I mean, overall, what did you, what did you think about the Binance? Uh, I mean, it's settlement? it's fascinating. Um, certainly, the the fine is a large number. The yes. number, the volume of transactions is super super huge. Yes. So if we go back, there were some Poloniex settlements in Ohio years ago, and they were doing you know billions of dollars in payments that were you know unlicensed money transmission, whatever, and they paid like a, a low six figure, five figure, whatever fine. Okay, uh, what's the total payment volume that's gone through Binance since 2017, right? Mm -hmm. It's certainly in the hundreds of billions of dollars at least, trillion yeah. dollars, trillions of dollars, whatever. So, yeah, comparatively, it's a larger fine than it was for some of these money transmitter weirdnesses. Um, but it's commensurate with the it's incredibly high size of the yeah. payments. I, you know, whether it, it should is, be it is $500 million or $5 billion, I, I don't have a strong opinion on um, the extent to which it's kind of the largest fine of this type that's ever been levied. It's also the largest amount of sort of a payment network that didn't file any paperwork that's ever been constructed. So, okay. Uh, yeah, uh, the main feature seems to be that they wanted access to a lot of records and information and cooperation and sort of demonstrate that you have to get licenses or you'll be stopped. It's hard for anybody to believe they're bigger or more too big to fail, yeah, such I, as it I, is. I noticed that. I didn't, right. I didn't see him try to maintain the fact that, that, that the U.S. has no jurisdiction over him or for him to proclaim himself self-sovereign or something like that. We didn't see any of that nonsense. Well, he specifically said, and this is the transcript of the plea hearing yeah. that he had been... And it's a little bit unclear if this is uh, English, if this is lack of intonation, because there's no recordings yeah. in the court thing. It's just written transcript. If this is an English issue, a phrasing <coughs> issue, or a, you know, you'd make sense on camera but doesn't written, that he'd been offered UAE citizenship and didn't want to use that to avoid these things that made it unclear as to whether or not he'd accepted it and it consented to extradition anyway or whatever something like that had happened but certainly in the appearance in person he made a point of saying like I would like to deal with this problem and not have this problem going forward exactly what problem was conveyed in the negotiations prior to this unclear we only know it's in the documents but uh, yeah no one seems to be asserting that the US doesn't have authority here which doesn't mean that there isn't a plausible case that they don't. It only means that they were able to convince people that they should submit to such jurisdiction. It's yeah, a lesson so there somewhere, right? One, one of the things that did surprise me is that you know, knowing the fact that there should be a custodial sentence at the end of this is that he... I mean, yeah, it could be what Arthur got uh, home, home detention, so, you know. Oh, anyway. so so, he, so that that's... I mean, yeah, I guess it's possible that he can build his own version of La Cathedral. In, uh, in the cat skills, but I'm, I'm not guessing that that's going to be the case. Uh, I've read a couple people who were speculating he'd probably just get home detention. <clears throat> I mean, for white collar, this is in some sense white collar, whatever. So may maybe I would not be astonished if he was told you need to buy a house in the United States, whatever, and then do it. Because I don't think you can and, do home detention in and another do a public country. Kind of thing. Uh, I mean, you can have issues with uh, common home detention for criminals in the U.S. or not, whatever you think is going on there. But that is a thing that happens often enough so it would not be astonishing were that to be the outcome i guess i guess to, for some people that might be somewhat unsatisfying i mean those you know those people who would probably want him to be in a place where you have to go to a prison and punch the guy, biggest guy in the room just to establish your authority i mean i would say anybody who's unhappy about that your problem is with the way that the u.s criminal justice system Correct. works and that a one-year sentence for a white-collar crime often results in this kind of environment he should be treated like everybody else consistently with the way that system works. You don't like that system, vote for a different system. You know, moving on. So, 
Okay. Um, we've had also questions. Um, I, I want to address this one, which is that: Do we think that you know, with new management coming into Binance, Binance can clean itself up, restart, and you know, so be successful? I mean, it's hard to believe that not having any KYC procedures is going to fly at this <coughs> scale yeah. again. Also, the nature of the consent decree type stuff that gets entered into here. You know, they're promising not to violate the law. The reason usually settlements with the government in the U.S., you have to agree to not violate the law. Of course, everyone has to not violate the law. The point there is that if you do it a second time, they come at you much, much, much harder. And that's kind of the way, again, the system operates. So Binance isn't going to be able to get away with not doing KYC going forward at all. Yeah. Um, whether someone else will have a go, this feels like a bit of a you know additional warning shot in that space. Certainly somebody will have a go, but you'll probably get shut down faster. I would also expect that banks have well have been told now for months, right, that processing payments on behalf of people like this that don't have licenses is going to cause more and more trouble for them. I would not be astonished to find out that there were some bank fines and settlements associated with the Binance situation because, you know, if I would not be very happy if I was the account manager for one of Binance's business banking providers at this point. Anyway. So... That having been said, um, I think another question that that I saw was, um, what what do we think about now? Now that Binance is sort of like you know, th there are some rumblings about FTX so restarting, and like in the context of so Binance turning over a new leaf, do you think FTX has the capability to sort of like restart itself? Well, I mean, it is very rarely the case that <laughs> having eighty percent market share with one player in any industry is a good idea. It's yeah. nothing to do with crypto. This yeah. is just the world right? yeah correct so usually that's not the best outcome for anybody except the operator of standard oil right it worked well for the rockefeller family yeah uh, okay so yeah you'll probably have more people having a go that's fine in fact if you had a large number of people trying to do this at different levels of compliance the only way to find the right balance between you know draconian documentation requirements and only onboarding three people per month and allowing people to submit you know passport images downloaded of google images <laughs> Right, there's a lot of space between those, and the way to find out the right level is, this is very much the American way, such as it is, people will try different amounts, get in different amounts of trouble, and we'll move forward. <coughs> we now have a couple stakes in the ground for what is and is not okay, and we'll see from there. Everyone historically who's tried to run an extremely compliant onshore crypto exchange has gotten almost nowhere. Yeah. Right. I mean, I would not describe Coinbase as an extremely compliant, because they would say, unarguably they don't list any securities and there is questions as to whether or not some of what they list are securities right so you could be a more compliant exchange yeah. than coinbase i don't think coinbase would even argue with that they don't have the the most restrictive possible listing policy well um, they can't because then then, then in, in some ways it wouldn't be a viable business it's a business question whatever. correct but yeah. you know so this will allow people to have more space to to experiment in that one that's fine that's the way this is supposed to go some of those people are supposed to get in trouble and some of those people are supposed to have successful businesses that's how Capitalism works. Another interesting question before we move on to the next topic. Um, they said that, you know, now that Binance is kind of settled, uh, is it up only? And I think, you know, no, there are still a few more shoes to draw. Yeah, this is not finished. 100% this is not finished. Um, as we'll come to in a moment, there are still signs that things are brewing in ways that are... Um, I mean, I smile because it's going to be interesting, right? Because it's going to be interesting. It's the, the Chinese the, that live in interesting times. The 800-pound yeah. gorilla in the room remains tether. The the glue that 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 sticks everything. And I mean, there are a number of long-serving, reasonably as large crypto exchanges mm -hmm. that have yet to go through any kind mm -hmm. of a procedure like this. So even separate from tether, but you know, Bitfinex been an exchange for a while major exchange major exchange that hasn't had any trouble would be a new experience for a lot of these things so you know anyway well. all right so we're going to move on to this blacklisting uh, one of the things that came up as we were watching um, and if, if you obviously if you follow the twitter feed you, you'd have received a whole bunch of alerts on on wallets that have been blacklisted recently um, one of the things that i found peculiar was that um, looking at the data you see a bunch of tether that's uh, wallet addresses that have been blacklisted. Um, Protoss did a piece on, on some of our tweets, which uh, noticed that like although $225 million was blacklisted, $70 million kind of managed to slip through before the blacklisting ha occurred, almost as if somebody had tipped them off. I'm not going to speculate here. But then the other thing is as well, whereas on the one hand, we've seen a whole bunch of stuff get blacklisted, 
maybe 225, whatever the number may be, we've seen a very similar number across the aisle get minted at the same time. It, it looks at least, <coughs> you know, prima facie on the face of things, as if like you're swapping out one questionable bit of tether for a clean bit of tether. Th yeah, there isn't okay. a proof of that. We d we're not saying that that's the case. All I'm saying is that it looks, you know, very well, okay. coincident. Yeah, so this is a kind of a long time question mm -hmm. about how a lot of these centralized stable coins that do freeze funds, yeah. seize whatever funds people work. Um, you know, the tether's architecture is a bit unique in that they have all of these authorized but unissued tether that sit in various places and they're also the owners of a, of a crypto exchange. So something that plausibly could happen for smaller amounts historically the blacklisting amounts have been quite small is that they simply blacklist your tokens but credit your account to bitfinex for the same number of tokens no one's saying that's happening yeah. but that stuff at a smaller level would never have been noticed before this for the first time ever seizures of this freezes of this size probably don't fit within the buffer that's hanging around that's available for doing those things so were that a thing that routinely happened you would see this type of behavior now where the stuff is frozen and then it's freshly minted to somebody whatever similar sort of account access somewhere again we don't know that's happening Correct. but there is a difference because the size of the seizures is so much larger than what they've done historically that you might start to see that you know, visible in the in the activity where you wouldn't have earlier seen it. I'd also say that this sort of thing isn't unprecedented. I mean, we know for a fact that, and we covered this a couple of months ago, um, Paxos, right? Yeah, so... Paxos yeah. swapped out winter mutes, uh, do dollars that were, like, stolen or something like that and gave them fresh. Yeah, so there was a winter mute, whatever, <coughs> hack, exploit, it's a problem, and, yeah, a bunch of the, the USDP there were burned and then reminted to different addresses associated with winter mute, so clearly there is a procedure. I mean, winter mute is a you know, company, reasonable, whatever. Maybe they went to the police, complained to whoever. No one's saying the right process wasn't followed, just that yeah. a process exists and, a and process that stuff exists. happens. Yeah. So it's entirely plausible, and we're not saying that this is the case, but it's entirely plausible that now Tether has long-time customers. They go like, okay, guys, you guys, all your wallet addresses got doxxed. We have to blacklist this stuff. Don't worry. It's going to appear on this site. Not saying that that's what they did, but I'm saying that, that it is possible. Or they could also simply mint the tokens and put them in their corporate whatever account because the dollars now have to sit and be segregated somewhere. I, we, we don't know. We don't it's just know. interesting to see. It's um, interesting to see, and I think that the, 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 the way the, the numbers line up makes it interesting. Well, I mean, okay, at, were I running this, the, the, the operation yeah. and funds were frozen, yeah. I would you know blank these tokens, then I would mint fresh tokens, and I would put them into a segregated account for the pending law enforcement resolution. Yeah, which is not otherwise, it's, it's, which is reasonable. Otherwise, I would need to segregate my dollars to match the smaller number of tokens outstanding, and yeah. say, oh, well, there's 80 million whatever dollars have to go in a separate bank account and track that separately. Rather than doing that, I would just use the blockchain token holding records and have a address or addresses that were associated with those holding areas. That's how I would run the record keeping. I don't work at Tether, but, you know, um, so uh, it's also equally conceivable that that's what's happening. Um, we will eventually find out how this thing really operates, but we don't yet know. No, we don't. So finally, to talk about pig butchering, it always gets me hungry. Um, pig, pig butchering, not necessarily, uh, pig butchering, for those of you who are not familiar with the idea, um, it's that in Asia, you run a scam where you basically fatten the uh, the victim by you know getting them to uh, you know increase the amounts of money that they, that you take from them you fend them up and then finally you steal all of the money the crypto whatever stable coin which well, increase <laughs> promised returns yeah, getting promised people returns. to more, yeah, more, more and then you yeah all the money so hang, hence pig butchering because you fatten up the pig and then you butcher it so um, it's interesting that that there has appears to be um, across the Pacific from the U S and China some kind of consensus that look we have to do something about this which is strange well, sorry, to me these large yeah. seizures are associated Correct, with yeah. with pig butchering stuff which is generally run by you know, whatever east asian criminal type operations this is covered in the newspaper over and over and over for years now this is a so i found that interesting simply we get like police notices on the street here telling us to be careful about yeah, yeah, yeah. This, is a, so, this is a popular culture problem so i i found that to be interesting simply because you know in the, in, in in the list of priorities as to what you want to take care of i mean like you got fentanyl fine uh terrorism flows money laundering sanctions evasions that stuff should necessarily rank pretty high up on on the list of priorities of things that we want to address pig butchering as, as egregious as it is and as many victims as it claims 
isn't to me like something that I would um, imagine that Washington and Beijing would no, agree on. It's been traditionally the last few years more of a priority for governments in this time zone, yeah. uh, give or take. Not so much Western so much. There's concerns with scams and things, but you know, this is really this is something you see in the newspaper routinely yeah. in countries in Southeast Asia and East Asia, where people getting arrested for scam syndicates being shut down for for these types of things. Yeah, and I don't think it's something that is as high a priority outright for the U.S. government. So to see, um, was it Tether, the U.S. and OKX, I think was yeah. the headline. You know, working together to help combat these types of scams tells you that. I guess the people perpetrating these scams have managed to sufficiently anger groups yeah. that don't normally get along very well, yeah. which is interesting. I mean, you don't think of OKX, Tether, and the United States government having the same agenda a lot of the time. Yeah. So, you know, uh, people who follow what U.S. politics and Facebook may recall it was discussed how Mark Zuckerberg had managed to piss off Democrats and Republicans in the U.S. at the same time, and the only thing people agreed on for years in Washington, D.C. was that Facebook was wrong. Uh, it's not going to end well, right? So, I mean, again, these are whatever people, criminal scans or something. It's just interesting to see that that's now a priority for groups I, that don't often agree on much related to crypto. So. I, don't, I do wonder why that is, though, because if you think about in terms of the demographic of the victims, it's, it's neither very large, nor very well connected, nor very well healed. So it's, it's just surprising because this is not like, uh, uh, I mean, you know, whatever your views on politics are, I mean, this is not really your tier one priority in terms of like you know if you i mean the scam stuff is large enough it's certainly in the newspaper a lot here i i i, I don't know I, I i i'm a little bit surprised at the same time i'm sure the u.s is perfectly happy to go with seizure orders stuff whatever criminal try to participate shut stuff down they, they don't have a vested interest in perpetrating any of these crimes yeah. so it's not you know i don't know Right. I mean, so um, on that note, thank you for tuning in. Um, we hope you have a great weekend. Uh, if you've got any questions, hit us up on the comment section below. Don't forget to like and subscribe or to share the video. Um, thank you for all the email questions that you've had sent to us. We appreciate it. Keep that coming. Um, and if not, then we'll see you next week. Bye-bye. Yeah.